So today, uh, unlike most other workshops, I'm not going to start in R. I'm going to start with some, some background on the methods we're doing and the sort of database of information that we're using to do them, the gene sets, as you were. Uh, you'll see this term gene set enrichment analysis or GSEA quite often. Um, and the one important thing to note is that this, you know, sounds really general, right? Like it's like gene sets and then enrichment. But this GSEA is actually a really specific sort of analysis uh, that we're going to do. We're also going to do what we are terming like simple enrichment, uh, which is technically enrichment of gene sets as well, but doesn't have this name. Um, so that can be a bit confusing. But if I say just enrichment, I'm talking about the first thing we're doing, which is a simple or hypergeometric enrichment. Um, and if I'm saying GSEA, it's this very particular thing. So the reasons why we're doing this is because gene sets allow us to take a list of a lot of genes or even a few genes that we're not sure how they're related and give biological function to them using you know, statistics and kind of an agnostic view of it, not of us going through and saying, here are my 30 genes that differed in my experiment. I'm going to look up all 30 genes. I'm going to try to learn enough about them to make connections, which for one takes a lot of time and is very hard. Um, as well as is not, is it's going to be very biased. You're going to, you know, use the resources that you use. Somebody else might use different resources. So this is a way to give biologically relevant terms um, or gene sets to these data that, you know, are less biased. The gene sets themselves were created by humans, so there's still bias, but uh, only at that level as opposed to your frantic Googling of your many genes of interest. So when I say a gene set, this is an incredibly general thing. It's just two or more genes that are similar in some way. Uh, they could have a shared function, like they're both kinases. They could have a shared structure, like they both have a transmembrane um, alpha helix. They could localize to the same location in the cells. They're both maybe associated with the Golgi um, or really anything. And so it really is down to you the researcher to pick which gene sets and which areas you're interested in because there are so many different sorts and they vary in a lot of different ways. So the big ones being um, they can be defined anywhere from an individual study all the way to very general knowledge. So you'll see some gene sets that have like a PubMed ID attached to them and are something like, you know, these 20 genes go up in response to um, you know, our lab, tuberculosis stimulation in macrophages in the lab at six hours. So it's like I said, it's a very specific experiment. And these are the genes that they found were significant. And that's like the most specific gene set you could get. And these often are smaller. They're on the order of dozens to hundreds of genes generally. Uh, but you can go all the way up to the other end of it's just general knowledge. Like this is a kinase, this is associated with viral infection in some way, not getting any more specific than that. And they range all the all along this gamut. And when we see the results, we'll, I'll point out some of the sort of classic different uh, levels. As I mentioned, they vary in size. Um, I've never seen a gene set that's only one gene. I think technically it could be, uh, but generally it's two genes. Otherwise it's not a set, it's just one. Um, and all the way up to thousands. Uh, there are some gene sets that are that large. Um, when they're thousands, they're very hard to interpret. So the ones we'll be using generally are on the range of 50 to 200 genes that are grouped together by some similarity. They're also not exclusive. So one gene is a part of many, many gene sets and they're often redundant um, and overlapping. So there might be two gene sets that can both contain ex the exact same 10 genes, but have a slightly different label. Um, and this could be that there are just two gene sets in the database, or maybe they came from two different databases where one says membrane and one says lipid bilayer to be more general. And but in the end, it means the same thing. And so we'll see in some of those results that you may get a hundred significant gene sets, but if you actually read them, like there's groups of like 10 of them that actually are like the same kind of thing. Um, and that also comes down to what you picked. If you picked something that was an individual study, there's a lot more redundancy versus the general knowledge tends to have been curated to remove that redundancy so that you really just get one term per big picture 
thing. You can get gene sense from lots of different places. Uh, the one we're going to use is from Broad. It's their molecular signatures database. Um, and I'm going to highlight the ones that we're going to use in the workshop, uh, but there are other ones there and in other databases. So the first is Hallmark, um, and this is taken directly from the website of their description. And so Hallmark is very, very broad. There are, are very few Hallmark terms, and they've been very heavily curated so that there's not overlap, there's not redundancy uh, in what the terms are. So they really represent really well-defined large biological processes. Um, and they were defined by Broad by taking all their other gene sets from themselves and other databases and using you know, algorithms to combine things that have similar terms and then very importantly, concordant expression, meaning the genes in this go up in response, all of them, and the genes in this go down. And there are a couple of hallmark terms that are actually split in this way that you have cross signaling up and cross signaling down because there were enough genes in those pathways that were important, but they had different directions and they were split by that way. So this one is the one we'll use the most heavily. It's the one we always start with uh, because it's usually the most interpretable. Uh, there are only 50 and some things, you know, like the haplocolysis, inflammatory response, apoptosis, and things like that level. Um, this is great because it's usually the most interpretable, but we do have the one caveat that because this is the most heavily curated, uh, the 50 gene sets represent about 4,400 genes, and there's a lot more than 4,400 genes in the human genome. Uh, so there is a level of you do miss some things with this. Um, but the other gene sets that we'll talk about can often get what you miss, which is why we run more than one. Another big one uh, is these curated. So they're, they're listed C2, C3, these lists is C2. Uh, and we like the canonical pathways. And so this is Broad going to other databases like KEG, um, enzyme, encyclopedia, reactome, uh, and things like that, and pulling in those gene sets into the same format as, say, the hallmark, uh, which is nice for us to use because Keg and, and others have different formats, so we don't have to custom format them every single time. And so these really represent biological processes. So like enzyme functions and th things like that. Uh, and there, you know, it's depends on which database you came from, but in general, Bro describes them as being curated by domain experts. So these are not single study gene sets usually. They're more generally held knowledge and um, often have multiple studies that have pointed to it over many years. Uh, the subset, this canonical pathways that we use is almost 3000 gene sets now, um, representing the majority of the human genome. And things in it are things like you have a caspase pathway, which is a little bit general, but gives you somewhere to start. Things like signaling by, so like notch one, signaling by a specific pathway or a specific protein or gene, uh, and then DNA repair. So uh, these are all you know more action-oriented uh, pathways. Get even bigger, the next one uh, that we like to use is gene ontology. So if you've heard of GO terms, that's what these are. And Go terms have a lot of different sections. We like the biological process section because again, it's action oriented. Uh, there's also like cellular component, which is more where does it localize in the cell? Um, and we're more interested in these, these activities by gene products. So again, like what is an enzyme doing and things like that. Uh, and this is larger, it's the largest of the ones I'll show of uh, about almost 7,500 and, you know, things again, ranges a bit in how specific it is. So we have things like viral life cycle, which is a little bit general, but then we have things like vitamin D biosynthetic process, like the synthesis of this specific vitamin. Uh, and then even more specific, like mitochondrial trans, you know, specific component and a specific function, uh, calcium transport. So, you know, it's nice to have the, the C2 and C5 in particular because, or together I should say, because they range in how specific they get. And so sometimes it's, uh, you get, you know, a hundred of these gene sets to look at and it's, it allows you that granularity of like, oh, this gene set was significant. It's kind of the general version of these three other ones. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work though. We'll see. Sometimes it's 
not interpretable and you really need to go back to Hallmark to be able to interpret it. Um, one big thing we've noticed is that if you have a lot of significant Hallmark terms, you will have an unreasonable number of significant uh, more specific terms to go after. So that's why we generally start with this Hallmark start to do some biological interpretation from there, start to look up some individual genes highlighted by these hallmark terms. And then if we need more granularity then doing these other uh, sets. And so both the simple enrichment and this GSEA, we're gonna do use these same gene sets and don't have to use just these, but you know some other ones just to note if you're working in a different area that are in Broad, uh, things that we have found that are too specific, so they're often individual studies, um, are these chemical and genetic perturbations, um, and then immunologic signatures. And then areas that just are not too specific or anything, there's not what we've been looking at. There's chromosome position, so if you're looking at chromosome, chromosome chromatin structure and such. Um, there's gene regulation, so like transcription factor oriented, uh, which is actually looking this up for this workshop reminded me that I actually do want to use this gene set for something. Uh, not going to highlight it today. And then there's a couple that are cancer oriented in specifically, which for our tuber tuberculosis research isn't, isn't relevant. See this lovely cat shaped shadow. <laughs> So those are what other people defining gene sets for us. They're very well accepted. They're very heavily used. Uh, technically though, you could make your own gene sets if you wanted. It's just listing genes that are similar in some way. Using these gene sets, the first thing we're gonna do is called hypergeometric enrichment or simple enrichment, which for those with stats background under the hood, it's a Fisher's exact test. And what it's doing is it's calculating that the probability of the number of significant genes and you yourself have defined what a significant gene is, the probability that that gene list um, is in a gene set by chance. So basically are your gene sets enriched in these significant genes? And so how we do this, uh, first you define genes in a gene set. We've already done that. We're gonna use the broad terms. Then you define what you mean by a significant gene. Uh, and this can be as simple as these are, you know, the most significant genes in my, you know, analysis of MTB infected versus media, which is what we're gonna do today. Um, but it could be a huge giant meta-analysis of years of data that point to these 10 genes being involved in you know, whatever, cancer or something. Uh, so it's just your definition and it only takes into account, yes, no, this gene is you've termed significant or not. So there's no granularity beyond it is or it isn't. Then you calculate the proportion of these genes that you've defined in a gene set, in, you know, in many gene sets in the end. And then it estimates the probability and our significance, the p-value of that proportion being enriched significantly or not any different than random chance that you could randomly get this many genes in this gene set. And this importantly is scaled to both how many significant genes you've defined in two and how big the gene set is. So some examples of things that likely are gonna be a significant enrichment versus not. For example, we have um, this fake Fen. Uh, let's say we have a really large gene set, say it's like 500 genes associated with something. And then you have you know, a smaller, but still reasonably sized number of significant genes. This overlap here is very likely to be a significant enrichment. Despite the fact that your significant genes are less than half of the gene set, it is most of your significant genes that are in this gene set. So that's what I uh, meant when I said it's scaled to the fact that, you know, how big was this and how big was this? And so, you know, the absolute value of the overlap is important, but also take, it takes into account the fact that, you know, it's not the majority of the large circle, but it is the majority of the small circle. So that's, you know, probably going to be a significant enrichment. On the other hand, if you have similarly sized, you know, gene set and significant genes, if you have very little overlap, you know, eat this, no matter what size the gene set is, if there's very little overlap, there are one or two genes, it's probably not going to be significant because it randomly throwing genes at, you know, at a gene set would get you a couple 
just by random chance. In contrast, if you have a really small gene set, like smaller than your list of significant genes, um, the opposite kind of holds true that, you know, this is now the majority of the small gene set is in the overlap, but the majority of your significant genes are not. But this is still a, a, a likely significant enrichment. And so kind of a simplification uh, is to think about that under, you know, it's scaling it based on the smallest group, whether your gene set is the smallest of the two groups or your significant gene list is the smallest. Uh, if one of them is majority, and it's not exactly 50%, there's, you know, more statistics involved in it than that. Um, but just as a simplification, if the majority of the smaller one is in the overlap, it's probably significant. And the just in comparison, you know, if there's not a lot of overlap, again, now it's not the majority of either circle, it's probably not significant. Yeah, I'm just quick yeah. clarification question. The So the gene sets that you have in this hypothetical example, this is just pulling any gene set in any database out. They haven't, you haven't like pre-selected these gene sets in, by some sec initial analysis, right? This is just the first analysis you've done is a, that you're doing is at the hypergeometric enrich enrichment, right? Yes, and it's generally, it's a generally agree agreed upon idea that if you're going to do uh, this sort of enrichment or GSEA that you don't curate the gene sets beforehand, because uh, that's you know the same sort of idea if you were doing a statistical test on a thousand genes and you just ran the statistics on the ones with the highest fold change, you're biasing yourself to find the significance ones, which is going to inflate your false um, positives. So same in this case is that you just you take a database of all gene sets and run all of them but it's you've curated your significant genes to just be these are the genes involved in whatever process i am interested in right so now we're gonna run that uh, and then we'll go back to the intro to talk about gsca background uh, but first gonna run some enrichment uh, should have you should have the full folder. Uh, it's also on GitHub, and I'm going to open the project. Everything I do is in the project. Um, if you're starting from scratch, uh, make sure that your data are in a data named folder, um, or modify the code to remove the data folder name. So here we have our lovely R Studio. Um, just for those who weren't an intro or need a reminder. We're going to have our file. We're going to make an R script where I'm going to live code pretty much everything in the notes um, and type up here so I can save it. It's going to run down here in R, and we're going to see our data um, up here. So I'm just going to save this. And I will upload this to, oh, I gave the wrong date. Oh, I'll fix that later. <laughs> uh, I'll upload this to GitHub as well. So to start, I always start my scripts with loading packages. So the packages we're going to use today um, are the tidyverse. You don't have to use the tidyverse to do these analyses, but everything I do in terms of data manipulation is the tidyverse. So. That's why it's here, but you don't necessarily need it to do enrichment. Um, we also need our database. So it's uh, M molecular signature database in R, as well as our actual enrichment, which is cluster profiler. And so this database, you could go to Broad online uh, and download it. But it's nice here that it's already in a package for us. Um, the important thing to keep in mind is that Broad updates these databases like pretty regularly, like every couple of months. And so it's a good idea to check your package version for, yes, capital V uh, of msig dbr dr. Um, and see here what version it is. And then we can go to 
road. If I pull this over. So if you just go to Broad and Sig DB, it should pop up. So it's at the top. And you'll see that it lists the most current version is 7.4. The R package is up to date. Um, if it's not, there you don't have to code this necessarily. You can do so go to packages update and then you know, you'll see some listed here but it, you know mcdb is not in one of them now you may run across a time where broad online has updated but the package has not uh, and in the end the answer to that is wait a couple days it will probably update um, or go to broad online and we can see here if we go to like the hallmark gene sets we could download them as well from here, both using the HGNC gene symbol uh, or an entree ID, which we'll talk more about gene IDs and how they're fun to try to find uh, the correct one, uh, but could be downloaded from here. Could I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, so when I, I downloaded the um, project, I believe the one that you put in the zip file and it, I opened it on R, but I don't have the MSIG um dbr or the cluster profiler did i download the package wrong if that's the case or was i supposed to pre-download those packages in my library yeah so you need to pre-download them so with you know install packages um and i believe at least cluster in msig db might be as well i think they're on bioconductor oh okay gotcha as well okay so msig db uh, is in CRAN, so you can just do install dot packages. And I know cluster cl cluster profiler is on bi bioconductor. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. And they're pretty small, so they should download pretty fast. Unlike the tidyverse, which takes <laughs> forever. So if I I have the same issue, Kim, but I'm now I'm doing the install dot packages msig dbr, and I still get an error. So, um, I didn't, put, that's right. I didn't. Put yeah, quotations, I think. Yeah. So that one, I will say cluster profiler might give you an error, um, but it'll list the like a couple lines up from the end, it'll list which package within fails to install. And if you install that package, I forget the name now, first and then rerun installing cluster profiler. Um, let's just, so it's in the notes, it doesn't hurt. Um, you notice that I actually never remember the exact code for downloading from Bioconductor. So I always just search the package name and then steal it from here. So <laughs> really great, if you find any any package on Bioconductor, we'll have this little, little we'll thing already. Chat too, for folks. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks guys. Uh, and of just for future as well, the we will also be using um, fast GSEA. So that's another one that you might not have downloaded. Okay. So while those download, uh, we're just going to load the data, uh, which is the same as intro R. So load data. So we have the same data from intro R. Uh, again, if you don't have it in a data folder, don't type data slash um, tab complete always. And these data, just as a reminder, are a list object um, where we have our information on genes. So like gene names, gene IDs, where they are. Uh, like you know, they're all protein coding, for example, uh, targets, which is just a sample metadata. So this is a very reduced sample metadata from the full study, but we just have, um, you know, participant IDs and whether it's media or TV uh, stimulated. And then E is our expression data of for all of the samples we have here, 
what is the log two normalized expression of every gene measured. Uh, additionally, we're gonna, we have some linear model results so that we could define significant uh, genes. And it's in a CSV, all of my data are in CSVs if I can do it, um, this model subset. And I never actually loaded my packages. So I never actually ran those lines. So. Um, as a quick note as well, uh, you will see, right, tidyverse loads a lot of different things, um, but you will see this fun, <laughs> these fun messages uh, often with enrichment things is there are a couple of human genome database and other gene set related things that have overlapping functions. So for example, here, this is saying that in the base R package stats, there is a filter function that now cluster profiler also has a filter function. And because you loaded cluster profiler, it will supersede that. Um, fortunately, in a recent update, uh, now it no longer supersedes the dply r filter function. Um, but if you were having issues like my code is exactly right and I've typed filter, what's going on? It, there is the possibility in a later version or if you have a different version that the filter for dply r you would need to put dply r colon colon filter to be like, no, use, use this tidyverse function. Whoops. Don't use this one. Um, so if that error comes up, that's what you need to do. Um, it, it won't come up on mine because of the thigh that my current version of R doesn't do that, but it did in the past, which was fun. So anyway, now this should run. Yay. Uh, so the model results. Let's view them here. So this is a subset of the results. So again, for workshop purposes, um, this was a much more complex model than this. There was like age and there was sex and there was TB resistor status. And there were a lot of other things in this model um, of clarity. I've just subset it to the media versus TB variable for every single gene. And we see our, you know, our p-value, our false discovery rate corrected um, p-value, so FDR. And then, you know, some other, the other names for the gene, what's its ensemble ID, where is it in, in the chromosome, and then this uh, entree ID, which importantly, not all data sets have, you know, the HG, this gene name is HGNC and the ensemble on the entree. This does, uh, and it, it's, I highly recommend if possible, always have every ID pop, you know, that you can, because it'll make, combining and comparing to things like the Broad database simpler. Because if you remember from the downloadable one, it only has HGNC symbol, so this gene here, and entree, this number, it does not have an ensemble version. So if you only had ensemble IDs, you'd have to convert them. Knowing this, I all of my data have all three now for, uh, just because it prevents <laughs> issues. So those are our data. And now we're gonna run enrichment. Um, for, all, for all that it is, right, it's just a Fisher's exact test. Really the, the meat and potatoes of running it is making sure everything is formatted correctly to play nicely in cluster profiler. So to run enrichment, the first thing is we gotta get our database. So get gene set database. Uh, we're going to run Hallmark because it's the fastest and the smallest um, and also where we generally start. So to do this, uh, msig dbr has the function that is exactly the same. So msig database r is how you pull out data. You tell it what your species is. So this has more than just human. Um, we want human, so homo sapien. And then you tell it what your category is. So is it Hallmark? Is it Broad um, specific? Is it Keg? Is it whatever? So in the help, so this, I know Hallmark is just H, 
right? But if I ask for help every time, DBR, um, you can see here, oh, great. So it, uh, it, it doesn't have it in the actual help page, which is unfortunate, but it does have it. It has the link you can go to the Broad page, which will tell you you know, what is it C2, is it C2 colon something, um, as well as I'll show you how to download the ones we had talked about later. Um, but in our case, Hallmark is just category H is the simplest. So I'm not gonna say this is anything yet, uh, cause I want you to see what it looks like. And so without saving, there's no new data up here, right? There's just printing out here. We see that it has our category, our cat, subcat so hallmark doesn't have any subcategories but remember our like cannot curated canonical pathways is c2 category cp for canonical pathway sub um and then we have all of our terms which are in this case all prefaced with hallmark underscore this is like this is adipogenesis here's the gene and then it has nicely the entree id the ensemble id so uh other it has actually many PubMed ID, it has every ID possible uh, nicely, which is another reason I also like this over the downloadable ones is that it has more potential IDs to overlap with what's in your data set. So to use this, we need to save it. Uh, I like short names, so I'm just going to call it H for Hallmark. And we can see it has, you know, this is the short form of the name, adipogenesis, uh, but if you didn't know what that was, it does also nicely have a, a bit longer description. And remember, importantly, the hallmark are concordant direction. So these are all up regulated. Um, and then there's things that are other gene sets that are down regulated. So the direction, unlike other gene sets in hallmark, the direction is concordant as opposed to just being related to the pathway, whether it's up or down. Just to make sure we need this to be a data frame. So if we ask class of H, yes, it's a data frame. Uh, you'll see in the notes that I also force it to be a data frame. That's again, a version issue. Older versions were a matrix, not a data frame. So it didn't play nice with the tidyverse. Um, but now this current version is already what we need. So that's our database uh, already loaded in. So now we need to define what we mean by significant genes. And in this case, we're comparing TB simulated versus media. And, you know, their FDR cutoffs to define significant are arbitrary and, you know, are dependent on every single database. So kind of as a aside, something that's not really running enrichment, but I wanted to show how I often think about this. And the first is just to look at the distribution of your FDR values. Uh, sometimes it's really clear where a cutoff should be, and sometimes it's not. Uh, and as a little reminder of how to run ggplot. So I'm going to use the model results data and plot. So aesthetics, aesthetics, a reminder, Aesthetics are anything that is in my data frame. So any variable I'm pulling out of here needs to be within an aesthetic. So in our case, we want our data to be the FDR values. And we're going to do a histogram. And because I always do, I, I like theme classic. You do not have to use theme classic, but it's my favorite. So if you run that, you see, it gives us a little message. It's not a, it's not an error, so it ran. We see our plot popped up. Um, but just as information, if you don't tell it how many bins to put your data in along the x-axis, it does 30. Uh, in our case, we're actually going to want more than that to really see this. So I'm going to make this 100, and we'll see our bars get smaller. So this is not an unusual distribution of FDR when you have a really strong variable. So MTB stimulation is, has an, oh, an incredibly large effect on gene expression. So we see a very skewed distribution of a lot 
you know, most of our FDR values are really close to zero. Um, and in fact, there's a there's a bit of a kind of caveat with these data. If we ask, so table will summarize for us. If we look at the model results, nope, model results. If we look at the FDR and ask, is it actually equal to zero, like exactly equal to zero, we see that there are 3,500 values that are zero. This is not real. FDR is never going to be zero exactly. So what happened is that the algorithm that we used to run our linear model um, at a certain point at, in fact, one e to the negative 16, it stops calculating uh, and will give you a value of zero to save time. Um, we have since <laughs> rerun this and you know you get on the order of like one to the negative 50 or one e to the negative 50 sorry uh so that's why they're they're basically zero but they're not exactly zero but that's why we see this incredibly like no matter no matter how far we zoom in here so like if we were to take this and like force it to zoom in by saying you know the limits of x are zero to one e to the negative let's do a little bit higher 15 so force it to only look at that little spot you know we see oh or it's angry for some reason we see that they removed a ton of the data because i did too small so it's very hard to see because the scale is weird but like there's still the largest bar still is like still at zero, right? Because they're, they're exactly zero. And so the case of, you know, what we're going to define a significant gene as is just, again, to have it run quickly, we're going to be really, really, really strict. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend being this strict in a real analysis, uh, but it's an arbitrary cutoff anyway. So Note here, just okay. Not trying to spell that right now, <laughs> and then we're gonna set a cutoff. So, we're gonna define what our significant gene list is, call it signif, and take our, take our model results. And again, if you're not live typing, you can copy from the from the notes. And we're going to filter to you know an FDR value. I always do less than or equal to. It won't actually change this. And here we get you know that's you know remember if you remember we had 3,502 that are exactly zero, and that gives us all of the ones that are exactly zero. Oop, no, don't want to see that. So like I said, this is not actually what I do with these data, um, but to make it interpretable <laughs> so we can see the blocks, we're gonna do this. If you were actually running these data, you know, I would explore a number of FDR cutoffs of, you know, what is the sort of signal you're seeing at a point, a classic kind of 0.05. And, you know, if you're more lenient, meaning you're allowing more through and maybe seeing less large effects, 0.1 and 0.2. Um, and the great thing about enrichment is that it runs pretty fast, then you can be comparing those and often you'll get the same things plus or minus a couple terms. So it's pretty robust to, to like small changes in FDR. But here, just to get to the shortest list possible, we're just getting all of the values that are exactly zero. So now we're actually gonna run enrichment. So like I said, the bulk of running enrichment is getting everything formatted perfectly. So the enricher doesn't care what gene ID you use. It's, it doesn't even care if it's a gene ID. You could technically run enrichment on a list of M&M &M colors, like it wouldn't care. Uh, it just needs to match. So whatever column we use from our significant list, so whether we use the ensemble ID or the entree ID or the name, has to be the same as what we're pulling out of our hallmark data. And so the easiest way to do that is to just very specifically define what you're gonna do. 
So for example, we could pull out just our entree IDs. So our significant entree IDs are the significant data frame. Oh, thank goodness brought up complete entree ID. Now, importantly, databases have redundancy. Databases aren't perfect. So there, it's possible that there are two genes in here that have a different ensemble ID, but the same entree ID. So to absolutely make sure we don't have duplicates, I say unique. So I don't like, I'm just deleting the duplicates. There, there's usually very few of them. Um, and in our case, we see that we have, you know, 34, 96 unique entree IDs from our 3,502. So there are a couple of duplicates. If this was, if this number was drastically smaller, that would be a note to go to the data and be like, oh, maybe I shouldn't be using entree ID because a bunch of them are NA. Some of them are missing. Some don't have an entree ID, um, which is the biggest thing. So that number is wildly different. Go look at your data. Uh, and see, you know, okay, is it that there's duplicates or in this case, it, there is a couple that, you know, they have an ensemble ID, they just aren't in the entree database. So then to make it perfectly matched, we're going to take our Hallmark database and do the exact same thing, pull out just what we need. So the cluster profiler needs both the gene set name to label things by, and then our list of IDs. So we take our Hallmark database, so tidyverse function select, the gene set name, so that's like Hallmark underscore adipogenesis, and our matching column, which doesn't have to have the same name here, right? Because we're just selecting it. I think it's actually gene, yeah. So now we just take in just the columns from this that we need. And that's just because the cluster profiler uh, doesn't have, an, it's not smart enough <laughs> to be able to pick the right column for you. So you have to give it just the two columns that it's expecting. So we'll get entree ID and then finally run enrichment. And so to do that, the function is just enricher. You give it your genes, which is our significant Andre. Uh, and then you give it your it's fun term to gene. That's just saying your gene set term, that description, what genes are in it. And then we should probably save this as something. So we're enriching the Hallmark data set uh, because we're going to be running like C2 and other things. It's always good to like be labeling all of these, the enrichment with H so you know that it was Hallmark. And we see it outputs a complex object. <laughs> so not a nice data frame. So this is an S4 um, object which we'll go into how to pull stuff out of. Uh, it's very similar to S3, which is like DAT is an S3, a, a list of data frames. S4 works very, very similarly. It's just a way to put a lot of things together. Like this is a data frame in here with your actual results that we care about, but then it has, you know, some of the parameters for how it was run are stored in the same uh, object so you don't lose it. And then, you know, it actually keeps all of the gene lists as well that you input. So it kind of actually takes all of your input data and all your output puts them all together. So this is how you would do entree. Um, importantly, our expression data are ensemble. So similarly, you could do exactly the same thing for ensemble IDs. And so I'm just gonna copy this and rename everything ensemble. Like I said, it doesn't care what your IDs are as long as they match. So our ensemble ID, this is just ensemble gene. So again, as long as these match, it will run fine.
Now, the, the reason I'm showing both of these is because of this. Because entree is missing some, and because some are duplicated, we see that we actually do have a different number of genes here. So running this enrichment with ensemble IDs and then entree IDs will give you a different result. Unfortunately, this is one of those like, this is just life. Uh, databases are curated by different organizations, different people. They're, we've been around a different number of years. They're not perfect. And so in the case of something like this, it's, it's very similar. Um, a couple of genes different. And so it won't matter that much. Um, if these are wildly different, it's always better to pick the one that has the most genes represented. So you're losing the one with the fewest missing and its fewest NAs. Um, in this case, they're really, really, really similar. And we get almost the same result I've looked at. But it is important to know that if you only have one ID, that's the one you're gonna have to use. And it may be slightly different than somebody else who's using a different ID. And it's just a, like I said, it's a unfortunate you have to accept uh, thing. Uh, in the end, we're going to use this ensemble one because, again, the expression data use ensemble IDs just to, and, and it's, you know, actually it's slightly worse <laughs> in terms of it has fewer uniques, but it matches the data and they're close enough that it's close enough. But just something else, just to cop, keep in mind, the IDs are weird. You could also run it on the HGNC symbol names, that gene column. Uh, I know that that has the most redundancy, so I'm not running it here. So our results, what is this? So it is an enriched result. Sometimes our packages make their own data type uh, specific to the package. That's what happened here. Uh, really what it is, like I said, it's an S4, meaning it's a list of a bunch of different data types. And so very similar to, you know, with remember with DAT, to get a piece out, we used a dollar sign and we could pull out any three of these data frames. Very similarly with the enrichment results, we just use an at symbol, S, this type of data uses at instead of dollar sign. And all of the data we care about are in result. So, okay, well, let's just look at the top of that. Let's just look at, see it's a very large data frame. There we go. Uh, these are our results, right? We have what was the name, the GS name, gene set name, and then some other data of interest. So it's all described super like in depth in the notes, but just things to note that it gives you two ratios, which are, so the gene ratio looking at, so the number of significant genes in the gene set, so that overlap between your list of significant 3,500 genes and genes in TNF, -A, TNF alpha signaling over genes in all of Hallmark. So all this, of my 3,500 and two, significant genes, only 1,260 or 83 were in Hallmark period. So genes in this specific gene set that are significant, genes in all of Hallmark that were significant. And so that's what I mentioned that Hallmark is the most heavily curated, so it's interpretable, but it doesn't have everything. So actually the majority of our significant genes just aren't present in any gene set in this database. Similarly, uh, we have BG, so ratio, which is the totals. So how many genes are in the gene set? So TNF alpha signaling is 227 genes. And then how many genes are in Hallmark? There's 4,892 genes in Hallmark. Then we have our p-value, our FDR adjusted p-value, q-value, which is used for p-value calculation and scroll uh, actual list of every single gene that was significant and in. So what, what was the enrichment driven by? It's all, all of these genes. The fun thing is this is a fraction, right? It's a ratio, but R doesn't know that. 
So if we ask it, like, what type of data are results? Now that, remember, result is a data frame. So now to get anything out of it, I have to go back to using the dollar sign. If I ask it, what is the ratio? It's a character. So it's reading it as number slash number. Uh, if it saw it as a numeric, it would turn that into a decimal. And so we're just going, I'm going to copy this from the notes because it's not really, it's just tidyverse. Uh, we're going to do some formatting to make this much easier to plot. So just to go through what we're doing here quickly, we're pulling out the result table. We're taking both of the ratios and splitting them, separating the first part and the second part into two columns so that they're numeric data uh, and just giving them the, you know, names that are still in, these names are under construction, uh, but term being the gene set, so like adipogenesis and category being hallmark. So like I said, this one is how, you know, how big is the gene set? How big is hallmark? How big is the overlap with the gene set? How big is the overlap with hallmark? Um, and then forcing them all to be numeric because remember it thinks they're a character and then calculating this what's called K over K ratio of how many significant genes are in the gene set relative to how big the gene set is. Because remember from those VENs, if you have a really small gene set, you need less total overlap to find a significant hit. Um, and maybe it has kind of just a different meaning. Getting two genes out of five uh, is a much bigger proportion than getting you know, two genes out of 500, but that number two is the same. So just calling it data frame now. See, you know, the, these are duplicated because um, for Hallmark they are, for other, other databases, those are different, but you know, really we care about what was our gene set and, oh, I can't see. There we go. Uh, and, you know, highly significant uh, enrichment, right? This is the first one that pops up of there's a, you know, of our 3,500 genes, 164 of them are associated with TNF alpha signaling. So the reason we calculated K over K is because that is the most common way to plot these results is to, because it's relative, again, it's the how many significant genes, remember you defined significant genes, are in a gene set relative to how big is that gene set. And again, because this is a lot of the intro R stuff, uh, I'm going to copy it from the notes because there's no point in me copying out exactly this plot again. Um, so we're just going to look at things with FDR less than or equal to 0.05, so significant. We're going to do some renaming. This is just to beautify it. You don't have to do this. If I'm going to remove the hallmark prefix and change all the underscores to spaces so they're more readable, I'm going to plot K over uh, K for each description, description being that gene set name, and then do a bunch of other things to make it a pretty plot. Um, but again, kind of have gone over GG plots. We don't need to rehash that. We do want to look at the results here. So, you know, this is showing us, you know, the, the genes, oh, the labels are backwards. <laughs> so what happens when you flip the coordinates? There we go. There we go. Now the labels are correct. Um, so this ratio is nice because this is showing us, right, that like of TNF alpha signaling, like more somewhere on the order of like 70% because this is a proportion of the genes are significant. So clearly this sort of signaling is dramatically impacted by MTB infection. Similar with you know, all these, these are actually all, these are very high enrichments. And remember, we're only looking at genes that are like P, FDR value of basically zero. So they are the most significant, but there are actually a ton more significant genes uh, if you use a normal FDR cutoff. So this would be your list if this was the, the significant genes you were interested in of, you know, now going and looking at, you know, 
are there specific genes in here of interest? Are these pathways testable? Uh, and moving on from there with more experiments usually. Any questions on enrichment before we switch gears to GSEA? Uh, in the interest of time, uh, the notes have how to pull out the C2 canonical pathways and the C5 gene ontology terms, uh, like what is the exact category and subcategory name. Um, so you can see that to run others. Because MTB infection is such a huge stimulation, uh, you know, in, in real world, I wouldn't even go run those because I would have so many hallmark terms to already see. But if you want to get some more specific terms, that you'd run exactly the same things, um, except, you know, put a different database here. So now to talk about GSEA. So again, gene set enrichment analysis sounds really general. It is a very general name. But this is a very specific analysis that we're referring to. Uh, you'll often hear, if you work with me, I specify this as fold change GSEA so that it's more clear. Um, but the actual term is just GSEA. So what this does is it compares expression of two biological states, so in our case, media and TB simulated, um, and determines if the gene sets so significant concordant change. So the important thing there, again, is concordant. If you remember that our, our hallmark terms are also concordant, so these gene uh, sets work really nicely in GSEA. Not all gene sets are. So some gene sets group together genes that are all related to a pathway, but one of them is significantly up in response in a pathway and one of them is significantly down. And you would get that from this simple enrichment, but you wouldn't see it in GSEA because the up and down cancel each other out and it's not a concordant direction. So it's always nice to run both because it gives you different things. Another way to think about this is it's just asking if genes in a set generally go up or go down in, in expression uh, between your two biological states. And you're grouping those genes by the predetermined gene sets. How we run this is we define genes in a gene set. Again, I already did that, we're using Broad. You calculate fold change. Uh, importantly, of all genes in your data set, you don't define significant genes versus not. You just calculate fold change across everything. You order them um, and you know map how many of those genes are in the gene set. And then you estimate this enrichment score um, and significance. And there's this really nice paper that kind of goes through like really the nitty gritty of how this is done referenced here. Uh, and the slides are now up on GitHub. Sorry, they weren't in the original zip. I hadn't finished them yet. Um, so here's really how that works is you have your two classes, A and B here, we have media and TV stimulated. And what you do is you calculate fold change. So red is a positive fold change, blue is a negative. And so in this, we have every sample is a column, every gene in the data set is a row. Again, all genes, not just significant ones. And they've been rank ordered by what's most positively correlated with A versus B. So again, A versus B order there matters because positive would change if you switch the order and most negatively correlated. So all genes. And then you map I, on. Yeah. Can I just quickly ask: Is this all? Is this genome wide, or is this all genes within any particular gene set? Genome wide. So this is done once for your data set, and then each gene set is mapped onto the same heat map, basically. Thanks. As you can see here, in that we have our gene set S, where the black lines are, is where you know this whatever i can't exactly line up but you know this this these three genes are some of the most positively correlated and they're in this gene set but the actual most positively correlated the top couple aren't in the gene set so this little mapping would look different for every single gene set 
just for visualization, kind of flipping this on its side, because uh, this is what they do in the figure to see it. So this is the same, you know, mapping. What you do in terms of how you determine enrichment is you walk along this bar, because remember this is ordered by correlation with your phenotype. You walk along the bar and say, you start at zero and say, is that gene in the gene set or not? And so, yeah, it doesn't map perfectly because pixels and trying to cut this figure so it fit. But basically every time it goes up, it means yes, it is mapped. So it's most easily seen here. Um, so it's, you know that there's three little ups, right? Um, that correspond to three genes that were significant uh, or not significant, sorry, that were in the overlap. So you stay the same if you're not in the overlap, if you are in the overlap. So it's the same as the, the like, the classic intro stats where you have a ball of marbles and you pull out, you know, it's mostly, you know, red marbles and a couple of blue and you pull out, okay, that's red, you pull out, you pull out. And so it's the same thing, you're walking along in order instead of taking from a bag, you're going, you know, along a line of them and saying, was this in the gene set of interest, this S gene set? Yes, increase enrichment score. No, keep in, you know, enrichment score goes down. And so you end up with this random walk along that eventually you reach a point where the enrichment stops, where you now have more genes that aren't in the gene set than are. And so this is, you know, a positive correlation with the phenotype. So it's all on the left. You could, you know, mirror it and see the same sort of thing. If there was a negative association of the gene set with the phenotype, you would see the same thing flipped of it, you know, wouldn't really increase, it wouldn't really increase, and then it would go up near the end. Um, and so the enrichment is wherever the maximum happens. And so this is why if you have genes in a gene set that are both positively and negatively correlated with your phenotype, you don't get significant GSEA because you end up with like a small hump here and then a small hump on the right side and they have a very similar maximum and they're not significant on their own. Importantly, when you think, when you ask like, okay, what genes are like causing this? There is a way to define this leading edge subset. So all of the genes that contributed to the enrichment score up to where it reached its maximum are, excuse me, termed the leading edge. And those are the genes that are having the most impact uh, on enrichment. And again, if this were flipped, it'd be on the other side. If it was a negative correlation, it'd be on the other side. And so this is bro GSEA. Uh, this ES enrichment score, what we're going to run is a next step where we are going to normalize the enrichment values relative to how large the gene set is. Because similar to simple enrichment, it's easier to get a significant enrichment in a small gene set, um, you know, proportion wise, you know, one out of four is a much larger proportion than one out of 100 uh, than it is the large ones. So to highlight some important differences uh, in these, that we have hypergeometric, what we did before is only running on significant genes. You're determining that subset often based on an FDR cutoff. And then we have GSEA, which is using fold change of all genes. So this is nice in the sense that you're not biasing yourself to a specific FDR cutoff, which is arbitrary. Hypergeometric though, uh, is significant or not, it's binary. Gene set, we have numeric fold changes. So it does have a bit more granularity, uh, similar to using all genes versus just significant. You do get a bit more granularity in being able to use a continuous variable. Hypogeometric, uh, it depends. Uh, so you, you usually you're running your models on the raw or at least the log two gene expression values in this case. You could run it on means, you could really, it's whatever, you want to define your significance by, it, it doesn't care. So really that is all a question mark, but for GSEA, um, despite the fact that you're using, you're using numeric fold change values, which gives you more granularity, but you're only using the mean per gene. So that means you've just actually reduced your granularity now. So you started out with, I forget how many, there's like 20 samples in this data set. You have a fold change for every gene, 
what GSE actually runs on is the mean fold change of that gene across all samples. That makes sense. So still more granularity than significance, yes, no, but less than you might think originally. Um, so that means that if you have a lot of variability from individual to individual, GSEA, the means might not be super representative. And so you do have the option of subsetting. So for example, if I knew age was a significant factor in my data, I might wanna run GSEA on the samples from adolescence separate from a GSEA on the samples from adults. Because if I know age is having a huge impact, then the mean across adolescents and adults might not be representative of either group. It would be some random thing in between that's not representing either. And so GSEA, you know, for, for hypergeometric, it's important to think about how you select significant genes. For GSEA, it's important to make sure you're only grouping samples that make sense. Um, and this is why, like, in our lab, you'll often see GSEA of media versus TB in phenotype 1 and GSEA of that in phenotype 2. Um, because the important thing here is GSEA can only compare A to B, two states. There's no complex modeling, none like that. Hypergeometric, again, because you can define your significant genes in any way you want. You, you could do a very, very complex model to define your significant genes and comparing a thousand states, like it doesn't care. Uh, but GSEA, it's always A versus B. And to get around that, if you have a data set that is more complex, you start subsetting of A versus B in group one, in group two, and then maybe one versus two in data set A, like, you know, you just, all pairwise possibilities. So now we're going to run that. Da -da -da, line break. So GSEA uses the same gene sets, but FGSEA, the package we're going to use, does not have the same formatting as Cluster Profiler, unfortunately. The databases you download directly from Broad are already in this format, which is nice. But for consistency, and so that I wasn't downloading more data um, on y'all, I'm going to take our, you know, see, let's look at the top of our H database. I'm going to take this data frame and force it into the format we need for GSCA. But again, if you went to Broad and downloaded it, it would already be, this is the version it's in. But you know, if it was downloaded from Broad and then you wanted to do simple enrichment, you'd have to reformat in that direction. So it's like, it's, you know, tomato, tomato, one or the other. So the format that I need is a list. I have to pick what IDs I'm going to use, similar to before. So I'm going to use the ensemble IDs, and I'm going to call it LS. I'm going to force it into a list. And there's going to be some new tidyverse functions in here for, for those who have only really started to get. So the first thing is, just like with enrichment, we have to only pick, we only have to only, we have to pick exactly what we want and nothing else. Uh, so we want our gene set name and our ensemble gene, that's it. We don't want any of the other columns. And what we need to do is we need to, well, actually, let's just let's look at this so you can see what's going on. What we need to do is create a single row for each term, each name that lists all of the IDs in a vector, like a single line with a bunch of, you know, a single column with a bunch of stuff in it. And I actually had to spend some time Googling to figure out how to do this. <laughs> and the best way I came up with is summarizing and then forcing. So this is, it's, this is, this is I would say, borderline hacky in terms of code. Uh, and I'm still in search of a better way to do it. But this is the current way. This is the way, as they say. So we're going to group by each term. So every term gets its own line. And then we're going to summarize, which is collapsing everything into a single line per whatever we've grouped by. And call all genes because it's going to be all genes. 
and we're gonna, this is where we're forcing it into a list. We're going to list all of our ensemble genes. Or again, so now we've created, if we look here, now we see we've created C, meaning it's a vector, it's a concatenated uh, list here of every single gene in each term. I'm then going to force this whole thing to be a list with a brand new table function. So now you'll notice here this changed. It's actually just everyone keep your eyes on this right here. So it's called a list. If I hadn't run dframe, right, it's, it's a data frame because it has observations and variables. Run that, now it's a list. And that's the very specific format it needs to be for GSEA of, and just like our data frame is a list of data, or sorry, our dat is a list of data frames, this is a list of vectors. And this is just one of those, like I said, kind of hacky things to get this to work. But once you get it to work, you just, or not you, me, I copy paste this code for all time. If you remember as well, databases aren't perfect. And so I'm gonna make sure I don't have duplicates by forcing this to be unique ensemble IDs. Which won't change much, but close a bunch of these. So it's easier to see. So some my RAM usage isn't crazy. So we can see here that nicely because it's a list, it does tell us there are 208 genes in this genesis. You know, said hallmark is rough is a couple hundred genes uh, maximum. So it's formatted now. That's all good. We need to calculate fold change. And again, this is a lot of tidyverse, so it's, it's, a, it's a copy paste moment because it's a lot of tidyverse. See, there's a lot of comments in here to try to walk uh, those less familiar with the tidyverse through. But just briefly, right, we're pulling out our expression data, the, the E data frame. It has row names that are the ensemble gene IDs. So we're going to take them from row names and shove them into a data column so we don't lose them. We're going to reformat the data. So always I like to look at pivots, make sure they're doing what I think. So my goal here is to have a column for my ensemble IDs, a column for my library IDs, which were originally column names, and then a column for all of our expression. And we see that. So the gene is, you know, repeated a lot. So for every single sample we have, you know, the gene, it's all the same gene. For every single sample, what was the expression? <coughs> and this is another thing too, this calculation of full change. There's actually a lot of different ways to do this too. This is, this is my go-to, there are other ways. So within our library IDs, we have all the information we need because we're going to compare media to TB within each individual and each individual has a unique RSID. So a faster way than what we've done in the workshops before, uh, I'm going to separate my library ID into those two components. If for some reason my library ID didn't have all the data I needed, right, we would do that thing we've done before where we join this data frame. So we join by our library ID to the DAT targets data, which has all of the metadata. Um, this is actually faster because you're not joining as one of the slower functions. So since it already has everything I need, I'll just run that. So just showing you what this does. It's thinking. There we go. Now it's it. So it's just separated these into two columns because really what I'm going to do is TB minus media. Pivoting again, I want TB minus media. This is the part where there's a ton of different ways to do this. I like to, to make sure that I'm doing it correctly and so I can see it. I like to pivot it so that TB is in its own column and media is in its own column. So 
So now I can tell it for each row, subtract media from TV, and that'll give me my full change value. And I know they match because they're on the same row with the same gene ID and the same person, RSID. <clears throat> because it's a change, I call it delta. And then again, GSEA is an average. You can't give it full change for every single individual. So then for each gene, I'm gonna calculate the mean and then you don't have to, I'm gonna arrange them by the means so that you can see, uh, you don't have to arrange them at this point technically. So really all of this and a lot of this for those who are, are newer to R and to Tidyverse, this is one of those, make sure you understand what each line is doing, but feel free to copy and use. That's, you know, that's a lot of how you learn to code is copying code and then using it exactly as is and then slightly changing it in future to make it do exactly what you want. But this is what I needed to end up with is for every single gene, I have a single mean delta, so full change value. And you see they vary, you know, about negative six to positive 10. And remember these are log two values. So, you know, positive 10 is actually huge. Another important note is these are log values, which is why I, you know, fold change is usually, you know, X over Y because their log subtraction math is the same, <laughs> the fun of logs. Uh, so if you didn't have log values, this might be TV over media uh, to do a fold change as opposed to TV minus. But because we're in the log world, that's actually the same. Um, and if you don't know about log math, um, I can throw, actually I need to add this to the notes, one of my favorite little um, online textbooks for how I learned log math, because uh, almost all gene expression stuff is in log scale. Okay, so now we format for GSEA. Again, half of, more than half of what we do is just reformatting and formatting. So it needs, you know, unlike before where it was in the table, it was fine. It needs vectors. It needs a, specifically, it needs a named vector where our values of mean fold change are the values. And it's not a separate column that labels it by gene, but it's names then, which I'll show you what those look like. So they're not a separate column, but they're still there. So our full change vector, um, you notice I like to call data types in the name if I'm just changing data types. A lot as we do in this is just going to take our mean delta values, which we see here, a numeric vector of our 14,000 and some odd genes. And then we're going to set the names of this oops, to be, oh my goodness, equal change ensemble IDs. So, like, just, if we look at this, we see it's just numbers, there's no names on it. When we after we run this, and if we look at it, we see now every number has a name, um, and it changed from right. We see if you keep your eyes on this here. We go from just a numeric vector, so it just says num, to a named numeric vector, and again, this is a very just. This is what the package needs to run. The final thing is that GSEA is statistical. So it has uh, tail, two tailed and one tailed versions like a t-test. So it matters whether all of your full change values are positive, all are negative, or they span. So we do need to set that. Uh, it has an auto setting, but I've had problems in the past with it throwing an error. Uh, so it's just easier to just set it yourself. Um, and so we do that. So it's called the score type. And this is just, are you dealing with all positive or all negative full changes? And so we can just ask, you know, what is our minimum of our full change vector? We know it's negative. What is our maximum? It's positive. And so that means that our score type is the default. So we wouldn't have had to do anything, um, but we, it's good to check is standard. So I'm just saving this as standard. 
if everything was negative, our score type would be neg. If everything was positive, it would be pause. Um, it's in the notes there. There's also a fun function in the notes that will automatically set this for you with a little if else statement that's kind of beyond the scope uh, of what we're going to do, but it's just there as, again, as a potentially useful in future for you. So because we have positive and negative, we're standard. Okay. And finally, we're going to run GSA. GSEA output here saving. Um, it's called fast GSEA <laughs> simple. It's funny after all this, right? It's the simple version technically. Pathways is our formatted database. Our stats is our full change vector, named numeric vector important. Um, our score type. You know, I could just type standard here, but you know, I've saved it as the same name. And then finally, you have to tell it how many permutations you're going to run. Uh, because it's estimating a p-value based on permutations, uh, you have to tell it how many. This is important in that if you have really, really, really small p-values, uh, you need more permutations to estimate them. This is just like the model results where we have zero p-values that aren't really zero. Similarly, GSEA, if the p-value is too small to estimate you need to start increasing the number of permutations to be able to actually get a value that's like, you know, one e to the negative 30. Um, this does have a, a limit, though. There is a point where it's going to take so long to run GSEA at that many permutations that it's not worth it. And so I usually I'll go up to about a million. Uh, and at that point, I say, OK, I'm just going to I'll fill them in with zero because they are almost zero. Uh, but again, they're not actually zero. They're just really, 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 really small um, for Hallmark. Because the gene sets are larger, a uh, hundred or a thousand usually it's, it's a good place to start. We get this warning, um, which you get very, very often in GSEA. So it's saying there are ties. So remember when we rank order things by correlation, that's an exact order. And then we walk down that order to determine, you know, was this an overlap? Yes, increase enrichment score. Was it not decrease? So if there are things with the exact same correlation, the exact same full change, it randomly selects which one goes before the other. Uh, this could be due to a lot of different things. This could be completely real. There could be two genes that have exactly the same full change value. It's possible. Um, more often, it's rounding error. They don't have exactly the same value, but R is only storing so many decimal places. So out to that decimal place, they're the same. Um, it also could be an error, which I've done before, where I've accidentally duplicated my data. So when this number is more than a couple percent, it's worth going back to your data and like making sure that those values are real and not an accidental duplication <laughs> or not a ID issue, like where you have three ensemble IDs for the same gene and they've been duplicated on three rows when they shouldn't have been, because uh, those all have the same full change value. Um, but it's something to keep in mind. 0.22% out of our, you know, 14,000 some odd genes is like two dozen or something. So it's a very small amount. It's very reasonable that due to rounding and other things this happened. So I don't worry about this. Um, the other error you might see is it'll say, just show what I typed it out here, uh, X, you know, a certain number of pathways, p-values were not calculated. That's that permutation thing. It's saying that you don't have enough permutations to be able to get a p-value here. You can either fill those in with zero because they're very, very close to zero, or you increase your permutations until it can estimate those. Kim, the, the ties issue, that's not just due to some number of genes having like undetectable expression, so they're all zero or something. It could be. This data set has been filtered Filter, yeah. um, to not have rare genes. But yes, if, if there were a bunch of zeros, that would cause, and that's, yeah, if there's, if there's a bunch of zeros in your data, that would give a higher percent. You should, for GSCA, those should be removed. So 
So we're going to final thing, plot the GSEA results. The output it gives you is very nicely already just uh, a data frame. See here, nice data frame. And look at it. We see for each gene set name here, you get your significance, your FDR corrected significance. We have this enrichment score, which from that slide with the plot, remember that's the broad enrichment score. Um, this FAST method, as they call it, has also uh, calculated a normalized one, um, which is the preferred version because it is normalizing to how big the gene sets are. And then you have some additional uh, often less used data. So N more extreme that has to do with the p-value. How often in your 1000 permutations did you get a more extreme enrichment by chance? So we see highly significant enrichments that never happened. Not significant enrichments, it happened a lot. Like this one, you know, almost 900 out of the thousand times random chance was more enriched. So not significant. Um, size is just telling you, you know, how many genes, how much the overlap was. So like how many genes in your gene set were available in your data. Um, so like, oh, where's always my favorite one? Interferon gamma uh, is, there's 200 genes in that gene set and all 200 were found in our data. Um, that's not always perfectly the case, but there's, when you're using a global level, you do usually see everything. And finally, it lists out that leading edge, like we'd seen before on that plot. So these are the genes that most drive this enrichment. And importantly, it gives you a leading edge even when the enrichment isn't significant. But if the enrichment isn't significant, this leading edge is, is not telling you anything. It's telling you it's driving something that's not significant, so you don't really care. Uh, but it will print it for all of them but it's obviously much more interesting for things that are actually enriched. Again, in the interest of time and because plots are plots, uh, this plot is extremely similar to the last one. It's copy pasting a lot of the same code. So I know that this is wrong still. <laughs> Again, P less than 0.05, just as a starting place. We're plotting our normalized enrichment score. And we see here, because we know we did TB minus media as our full change, we then can add direction here because TB minus media, a positive value means it's higher with TB stimulation and negative value means it's lower. So this nicely, unlike simple enrichment, gives us a direction. These are generally upregulated in response to MTB. These are generally downregulated. If you take the time to look at the overlap, um, almost all of our hypergeometric enrichment terms are found here. And then plus some, there's a bunch more additional here because we're able to see gene sets where maybe not a lot of genes on their own are significant, particularly at our ridiculously uh, strict FDR cutoff of negative e to the negative 16. Um, not a lot of individual genes are significant, but together a lot of genes change in the same direction, resulting in a significant GSEA. And so with that, that is what I had. Um, so to recap, right, there's simple enrichment to ask, is my list of significant genes enriched in a gene set? And then there's GSEA to say, using full change, are gene sets generally up or down regulated? And often they should, and often they do overlap in what sets they're telling you. Uh, so for the students here, there are some exercises in the workshop notes that I'd recommend of playing around with the canonical pathways database and the Go pathways database to make sure that you can rerun these things, but in a slightly different way, and uh, some more practice modifying ggplot. And with that, I'm only two minutes late, which I enjoy. Um, I'll stay on for a little bit and um, answer any questions anyone has. But if not, I will see y'all later.